Um, so I am a performance engineer at Ink Tank, and um, I'm just going to talk today a little bit about some of the stuff that I do. Um, and actually, I'm going to even start out by talking about me. So um, my background is actually in high performance computing. I came from the Minnesota Supercomputing Institute before I started working at Ink Tank. And one of the things that I did there was to uh, basically work on finding out how we could make our clusters more efficient and better optimized. And if you guys know anything about high performance computing, um, one of the things that drives costs on these machines is the big InfiniBand network on the clusters and the switches that go with that. And so we were kind of constantly looking at how can we offload the users that aren't really making good use of these networks onto some other kind of platform. And this got really political. I mean, some of the professors that we had would even like judge the merits of the science and the research that was being done based on how well they were using the InfiniBand network. And saying, oh, you know, I deserve higher priority than this other guy because my science is better. And, uh, so um, anyway, uh, what we started looking at was, could we take some of these kinds of jobs that aren't really using the InfiniBand network and move it over to some kind of like cloud infrastructure, like OpenStack? And so one of the last things I did there was actually built out an OpenStack cloud and looked at whether or not we could use this for some of these kinds of applications. The one remaining item that we didn't really have a good answer for at that point was storage. How do you find a good storage solution that these different uh, computational packages uh, could make use of that would work well in this kind of environment? And so I started looking into it, and I saw Ceph actually come up. And I knew about that from my experience in HPC. Um, if you, I think probably uh, earlier on, they might have mentioned that Ceph started out as an HPC research project. Um, and so, yeah, I had heard about it, and I'm more in the context of like a Lustre competitor at that point. But all of a sudden, I was seeing it, you know, come up for block storage for for OpenStack, uh, also S3 storage. Um, so it looked really interesting, and. I ended up coming and working for Ink Tank pretty quickly after that. So um, let's talk a little bit about Ceph. So this is a slide that you guys have probably seen in some form already, just kind of going over the different things that, that make up Ceph. At the bottom layer, you've got different daemons that are running on different, uh, different machines, OSDs, uh, metadata servers, monitors. We've got different abstraction layers on top of it, and APIs, Libratos. Um, LibCephFS, you know, and at the very top layer, uh, you know, the actual interfaces, Fuse, CephFS, the gateway, RBD, et cetera, et cetera. So if you're gonna take one thing away from this talk, it's that Ceph was really designed from the get-go to be distributed. We have distributed monitors, distributed OSDs, data goes everywhere. Um, distributed metadata services on, on CephFS, which is not production ready yet. Um, you know, so if you're gonna take one thing away, it's that everything is distributed. And a big part of that story is crush. And so you've also probably heard a little bit about this. Uh, Hash-based, basically clients can programmatically figure out where in the cluster data lives. Um, from a pragmatic standpoint, this is really, really important because in traditional distributed storage systems, you have some kind of centralized allocation table where you're going and hitting over and over again trying to figure out where data lives in the cluster. And that becomes both a big bottleneck and a central point of failure. And the, the amazing thing about Crush is that it does away with that and lets each client figure out where the data lives without having to do that kind of a lookup. Uh, from a performance perspective, that's really good because it means that you can actually scale. And a lot of other systems, those are, that is the big limitation that prevents it from getting really huge. Um, solutions like Lustre have actually done amazingly well under that kind of a model, but it's not gonna work forever. So that is a really, really big part of this. Um, and you get a bunch of other really nice stuff with it, too. Uh, Pseudo-random weighted distributions, so even data distribution across your cluster, uh, you know, uh, ability to hierarchically define failure domains, all these things are, are fantastic. So Ceph 
has a lot going for it. You avoid those data lookups. You have even data distribution. Um, healing is distributed. So instead of waiting for a RAID 6 array on one of your servers to heal for 10 hours, you've got the entire cluster participating in healing. And um, the storage backend is, is, backend is abstracted. You can put OSDs on top of ButterFS, XFS, EXT4. You can have a block device sitting underneath it. You can use something like fast cache or flash cache or bcache if you want. The, the possibilities are kind of endless. And um, one of the, the, the things that, that, that provides you is a ton of flexibility. But it also means that now there are kind of unlimited choices for you. Ceph is really ambitious in that it, it gives you a lot of different ways that you can kind of you know, hang yourself. Um, so coming to us for support is a really great option for a lot of people because we can help. Um, so other things to be aware of are that on a per pool basis, you really want your storage to be um, homogenous. You don't want to have OSDs in a pool that are much faster than other OSDs. The reason is that because the data is being pseudo-randomly distributed, eventually all of your outstanding requests are going to back up on that slow OSD or those slow OSDs. And your other OSDs in the system are going to be starved and are going to be waiting to try to get requests in. But that slow OSD is just chugging away there on basically every outstanding request because they just keep piling back up on it eventually over time. Um, Ceph loves concurrency. And this is true more or less than any distributed storage system. You've got tons of drives spread over tons of servers. The more concurrency you can throw it at, at it, the better. Um, and, and kind of finally, data integrity is kind of expensive. And, and Ceph really tries hard to make sure that your data is safe. Um, a big piece of that is that we actually do full data rights to the journal for every write that comes in. So the journal basically is um, an area of, of storage that data gets written to sequentially and it's direct I.O. And that is, at least in the case of XFS and ext 4 always done first. So write comes into an OSD, it gets written out to the journal using direct I.O., but it's always sequential. It's just appended to the last bit of data. Um, once the data is there, an acknowledgment can be sent back to the client. If there's replication involved, it also has to be written to the replicas journal. Um, and then that data is lazily written out to the actual data store uh, using buffered I.O. at that point. And that gives us a lot of um, security, one in that we know data has at least we've, we're fairly confident that data has hit the disk because we're doing direct I.O. write to the journal. But um, it also provides us some guarantees that we other, otherwise wouldn't have regarding um, how we do writes. So anyway, this stuff is kind of boring, right? You know, okay, I've got a bunch of text up here. Let's try something fun. Let's see how fast we can go. So um, about a year ago, the director of engineering at Ink Tank came to me and said, OK, um, if you could build out a box, if I give you $15,000, know, you put something together and tell me what you'd build. Um, this is what I came up with. And actually, there are a couple other controllers that I bought and a couple other things I bought to, uh, to do some alternate testing. Um, but this is kind of the configuration I was targeting. Um, now, I want to diverge a little bit. I was going to go on at this point. But there was an interesting conversation earlier about RAID controllers and write back cache, and when it's appropriate to use it and when it's not. Um, so we've done a lot of testing on this. And what's interesting, um, let's ignore SSDs for the moment and just focus on spinning disks. You've got the journals on the same drives as the disks. Um, write back cache or no write back cache. So when you are writing to a disk that, and you don't have write back cache on the controller, those writes are going to be going both to the journal and to the, the OSD, the data portion where data actually eventually lives. Um, if you are doing large sequential writes, um, you're essentially just having your bandwidth. 
because you're, you're basically doing a, maybe say like a four megabyte write to the journal and a four megabyte write to the data store. Okay, fine, it's pretty clear cut. If you're doing small writes, then the problem that you run into is you'll be seeking back and forth constantly between journal writes and data writes, and you'll have a lot of seek overhead because of it, and it slows you way down. Now, the advantage you have, if you have write back hash on your controller, is that because the journal is just doing sequential writes, it can buffer all of that up in, in the write back hash. And so your journal overhead becomes much, much less than it would be otherwise. You get a pretty big increase in, in small, uh, write, or, yeah, small write IOPS by having that write back hash available. Um, now, let's throw SSDs in the mix. If you have SSDs, and you're doing your journal writes to the SSD, you don't have to worry about that as much. So now, having write back hash on the controller isn't necessarily as quite as much of a benefit. Um, that's not to say it won't be a benefit in some cases, it might be. Um, but we've actually seen that write back hash, when you are just using the SSDs entirely, actually can slow performance down. So um, it's something that you kind of have to play with and test a little bit. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind, too, is that not all SSDs handle power outages very well. So you may want to consider a controller that has a battery and write back cache just for that benefit alone. So anyway, that was a little divergent from, from this talk, but um, let's, uh, let's go on. So when, when I bought this thing, my goal with it was to basically just try to hit like 10 gig E speeds just to be able to use one of the, one of the 10 gig ports and, and make it go. Um, in fact, when we bought this, a lot of the other nodes that we had in-house were not performing well at all. We had spent a couple of months trying to tweak them and just running into problems constantly. Um, that was like a year and a half ago. Within about a half an hour, I was already getting numbers out of this far, far superior to what we had been seeing previously. Um, and in fact, and I think this is Cuttlefish. Yeah, this was a Cuttlefish test. Um, you can see, uh, this is actually Rados Bench, which maybe I should explain a little bit. It, that, that test is testing the Rados level of Ceph and just writing out objects as fast as it can and then later coming and reading them back. So this isn't any like actual file system testing, it's just testing the Rados layer. But, but you can see for writes, we're, we're actually pegging the bonded 10 gig link that we've got on here. We're doing two gigabytes per second across all of the file systems we tested. So really, you know, these are very, very happy numbers. And, and for reads, we're not doing quite as well in this case, but we're still getting pretty high up there. I mean, it's, it's not bad. So um, if you, you missed it on the previous slide, this is with 24 spinning disks and eight SSDs in the node. So, um, you know, pretty beefy, but, but really the performance is, is not bad given the hardware involved. Um, so yeah, okay, great. You, you max out the 10 gig E network, and, and that's great and everything. But this is this is not necessarily a really realistic test. It, it is if you're going to use Librados. If you're going to use Librados and you're sending objects and, and retrieving them, great. This actually is a pretty good test. But um, say you wanted to use RBD. There's actually some kind of subtle differences between how RBD works and, and just writing objects like this. So with RBD, you actually have four megabyte objects that represent blocks on the device. And when you're doing small IOs, say like 4K IOs, um, you're doing 4K IOs to those four megabyte objects, which is a lot different than doing like a, a big stream of 4K objects by themselves. The, the patterns that are involved are different. And so, um, you know, if you're doing, say, OpenStack, you probably care a lot more about test to the block device than you do about Rados numbers. And we have done a lot of those tests. So this is a very ambitious slide, and I apologize if you can't read it. Um, the, basically what this is showing is we, we did a number of tests with both read, writes, uh, these are 4K writes, um, both random and sequential. And we're looking at both the kernel version of RBD and we're looking at the, um, the QMU KVM version with write back cache enabled. So not, not controller cache, but in this case, the actual RBD cache that we implemented, which is just a layer underneath the block device. So 
um, we looked at both number of volumes and also the I.O. depth. And these tests are using FIO, which is a very standard uh, benchmark for testing file systems. Um, the end result is that uh, RBD cache helped quite a bit, both in the sequential case and in the random case, which is a little scary. But it did, so that's what it is. Um, and probably the big thing to take away from this is that in all four of these cases, the scaling behavior looks totally different. In some cases, we saw scaling going across volumes, going up across volumes. In other cases, we saw scaling improving across I.O. depth on a particular volume. Um, or in other cases, it was almost flat. Um, so when you're doing testing, you really have to test your use case. Um, you know, there's, 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 it's not easy necessarily to infer what's going to happen by just looking at someone else's numbers. Um, and it's really, it's best if you can test your specific application. But this is maybe a close second where you can at least try testing the I.O. patterns that you expect to see. So OK, great. You know, these tests have all been done on one node and one client. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's great. But you know, what we want, really want to know is how does stuff scale? So, we got permission from Oak Ridge National Laboratory to share some results that we've been working on with them. They, they contacted us probably about, oh, like a year ago, a year and a half ago, and said, hey, we would like to try Ceph. Uh, we want to see if it would be a good uh, option as a potential replacement for scratch storage on some of our supercomputers. Um, they they uh, have some very high performance storage systems from DDN. I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with their products. but um, this is what they use for, for Spider and actually Spider 2, their next generation uh, uh, storage system on, on a lot of their systems. Um, so they installed Ceph and got awful performance. I mean, just really, really bad when they first started out. I mean, it, it's so embarrassing, I don't even want to say what it was. Um, and so they asked us, well, can you come in and help us? Can we, can we see if we can get this going well? And we agreed. and, and uh, we, uh, we started work on it. Now, I want to talk a little bit about DDN storage. They, they have done something very clever. Um, they basically give you a storage controller, or maybe it's two storage controllers, and say, here's how fast this goes, 11 gigabytes per second. That's what you get. But their pricing model is set up so that you are very encouraged to put a lot of drives behind that controller. And so I think their setup has something like 440 drives behind it. They get you thinking about how fast the product goes and not necessarily about your per disk speed that you're getting. And they do that, I, I suspect, because it lets you hide a lot of uh, issues that you'd run into with drive variability problems. If all of your drives are really topping out at something like 30 megabytes per second, you can afford to have some drives that are only capable of doing 50 megabytes per second because you'll never see it. So the upside of this for us is that this is a, a very, very stable, steady platform for us to look at stuff scalability on. Um, and and I, I assume that the way that they've done this is, is very intentional. So let's take a look at what we can do. So when we finished, working with them. And I think we were running, did I say on there? This, this is, I, I think, Cuttlefish, these results. Um, the most obvious lines you're going to see there are the, the blue and red lines for, for writes and reads. And, and this is Rados Bench again, by the way. Um, what's, what's not quite as apparent are these dotted lines. So let me talk about those a little bit. The, the green dotted line is basically how fast the disk fabric can go. Um, and that is basically it's this big controller with a bunch of JBODs behind it. And you've got, they had four storage servers that were connected to it via InfiniBand. And so one InfiniBand link, I think, can do about three gigabytes per second. And then you scale up to four. And it's, it's around, like I guess, one, you know, 12 gigabytes per second or 11, depending on which numbers you want to believe. Um, so we've got it up at 12 when it tops out at four nodes. So that's the disk fabric. Now, this setup was using InfiniBand on the front end on the client side as well, IP over IB. Um, we did some iPerf tests and measured that. And I think with four nodes, we topped out somewhere around oh, just shy of 10 gigabytes per second. 
Um, so that is what the client network can do. So in terms of how we do on this platform, reads are, are really great. Um, we're getting very close to the client network limitation. We're, we're scaling pretty well with it. We, we kind of uh, drop a little bit there, but it's, it's very pretty close to linear scaling. With writes, now if you just look at this and say, oh, well, you know, okay, look at it. Compared to our, our client network, it's way lower. Um, but we're doing journal writes, and we're doing journal writes to this DDN array. Now in a high performance situation, we'd normally say put those on SSDs to get higher sequential write throughput. But um, in this case, they didn't have any. So all of it was going there. So in, in reality, um, our 11 or 12 gigabytes per second now is looking at more like six. Well, if you look at it the other way around, I guess, um, if you count our journal writes, which is the, the dotted yellow line, um, you can see that we're actually getting pretty close to the disk fabric max. So in both cases, in read, the read case, we're getting pretty close to the client network max. And in the write case, when you count journals, we're actually pretty close to the disk fabric max, which is really good news because it means that on very steady hardware, we can actually scale pretty well. Now, it took some work to get here. I mean, we, we worked with them for quite a while, and we ran into issues where um, cache mirroring on the, the hardware was causing a ton of problems. And there were, uh, we, we ran into issues with the Linux kernel itself, where uh, there was zone locking contention in kernel 3.5, and we had to make sure that they upgraded to get around that. But in the end, I mean, we saw really good performance. So OK, but this is Rados again, right? So uh, oh, wait, sorry. I, Moving ahead of myself. Um, so, so one of the things that they let us do, which they weren't that interested in, but we were, is just looking at how much replication hurt on this machine. Um, we had fast networks. We had you know, pretty good scaling. We liked what we saw, so we, we took a look at this. Now, what you'll see here is that, luckily for us, read throughput is really consistent throughout. We're getting north of, I think, uh, eight megabytes, or eight gigabytes per second. Um, now, write throughput. The actual write throughput is in blue from the client perspective. The yellow write throughput is what you look at aggregate data going to the disks. So what's kind of interesting here is that you see um, once you jump to 2x replication, the aggregate throughput actually does go down a little bit just because of the added latency and added overhead of doing replication. Once you move to three replicas, though, that penalty more or less goes away. You end up with about the same amount of aggregate disk throughput. Um, of course, your client visible throughput is decreasing at each step. You know, makes sense, right? You're, you're doing replication. So um, one of the things I kind of wanted to highlight here, though, is how, look at how much of a difference you see there. You know, people don't really think about when they say, oh, yeah, I want to do 3x replication, how much of a, a penalty you do pay for that. I mean, you do end up with slower writes. If you're really interested in a read use case, that's not a big deal. If you're interested in a write use case, it can be a big deal. So certainly specking out your machines for whatever use case you have is really, really important. OK, so again, this is all Rados Bench. Um, this is a supercomputing site. They're interested in CephFS. They want a distributed file system that they can potentially use for storing analytical results from jobs that are running in these clusters. So um, disclaimer, CephFS is not quite production ready. Um, but talk to Brian if you are interested in it, because I'm sure he would love to talk to you. Um, we do have some people, some companies, in very limited situations uh, on a support contract for it. So OK, CephFS. On this cluster, we were, we were, when we first started, we actually saw, again, bad performance. It was not doing well. But eventually, we got to the point where we saw pretty good scaling behavior. Um, now. We're topping out at a little shy of um, like six gigabytes per second for reads and writes, basically. Um, but you know that's not bad for beta level product on four nodes, four servers. You know, six gigabytes per second is is pretty reasonable. Um, you can see that the uh, average write throughput had a, a, a dip there. We were seeing some cases where performance was kind of dropping and then recovering. Um, I suspect that's just due to the fact that we haven't done a whole lot of optimization on it yet, and there's probably some areas that we could clean up. But yeah, overall, not bad. So 
ORNL was really happy with this, and um, you know, I think uh, we'll probably see more testing in the future, but you know, if you're interested in CephFS, we can get good numbers. So let's see. Now, what I've shown you is just a snapshot of the kind of testing we do. I mean, like the, that, that chart where I had the four 3D graphs up, we've got hundreds upon hundreds of those things, you know, looking at different test cases and different scenarios. And there's tons of different hardware configurations and tons of different kinds of I.O. patterns. It, it, you know, it's, there's too many different permutations to test everything. You kind of have to go on instinct. But, and, and, and frankly, um, there's a lot of ways that clusters can, can have bad performance. There's a lot of ways to screw things up. So, um, you know, what I've shown you is really good cases, but we've seen a lot of bad cases too. So how do, you, how do you deal with that? Like, how do you diagnose a system that's performing badly? Um, so what I'm going to do is kind of finish up here by just showing you some of the examples of some of the tools that we use, that we used, in fact, in all of these things I just showed you to actually get those performance levels that, that, that we, we have here. So the first thing I want to talk a little bit about is the Ceph administrative socket. Um, on every single OSD, there is a socket that you can connect to and interact with the OSD a little bit. Um, one of the things it lets you look at is the current number of outstanding operations uh, on that OSD. But my favorite thing by far that, that you can do is there's a command called dump historic ops. And what this gives you is, uh, by default anyway, a list of the 10 slowest operations on that OSD over the last 10 minute period of time. And that's configurable, the number and, and the duration. Um, but what's even better about it is that it shows you for those operations, those slow operations, where in the OSD it was spending time. So you can say, look at, was this operation waiting on a journal write? Or was it waiting on the op commit to the disk itself? Or was it somewhere else in the code in the OSD? Um, was it waiting for an update from the, the monitor? Um, was the OSD waiting for that before it applied it? So this gives a really, really useful tool to get a very quick insight into uh, potentially where an OSD is spending its time. Um, if this doesn't give you enough information, you can actually go way beyond this by enabling the debugging, like debug 20 in the OSD logs. And then you get a gigantic amount of information about every single operation and what it did. Um, but this is a really good way to start. So um, yes, if you're having performance issues, this is one of the tools that you can use to start diagnosing that. Um, here is actually, I, I should have forwarded sooner, but this is actually uh, an example of the output that it gives you. Um, not incredibly user friendly, but it at least starts giving you some of an idea. If you don't know the code, you know it's it's uh, it's maybe less helpful. But um, yes, yes, it is. You should be able to uh, query this as well through our other interface that we're developing for, like an API for accessing this stuff. I think, but yeah, it is JSON. So um, let's move on. So collect L. This is a tool that was written by Mark Seeger out at HP. And it's kind of like a combination of Iostat, SAR, TOP, and various other things all on steroids. Um, he basically wrote this to try to get an insight into kind of every aspect of what's happening on a node. And, and really behind the scenes, all he's doing is just reading stuff out of proc. Um, but he's put it together in such a way that it's, it's very, very useful. And so just as one example, this is showing a view of uh, disk uh, uh, utilization. So you actually see an overview per second, and that's all configurable. You can even use sub-second. Uh, overview of reads, writes, um, uh, queue length and wait time, service time on the block devices, um, IO utilization. So very, very much the same information in this case that you see like with IOSTAT. But um, you can also look at uh, things like CPU, network, um, even slab memory and per process statistics. So it's, it's very, very powerful. Um, I use this very extensively. Um, there's very low overhead when you're collecting data. So um, it doesn't have a huge impact on what you're running. I basically just started up at the beginning of every single benchmark test. So I've got a record and then can go back and look at it later on. 
So Block Trace and Seek Watcher. Block Trace is amazing. Um, what it does is it lets you attach to a block device, say a block device that's sitting underneath an OSD, and look at the, all of the different IOs that went to that disk and where they went. And even things like what kind of operation it was. Was it a metadata operation or was it just like a write or, or you know, something else? Um, it's, it gives you a ton, ton of information. And SeekWatcher is a tool that uses block trace. Um, it was actually written by uh, Chris Mason of ButterFS fame. Um, and it will take that data and actually graph it out and show you where IOs are happening on the disk. So in this case, this is actually really old, and I, I wanted to get, there was, it's actually animated, it's a movie that, that goes over time, but I couldn't get it to work with OpenOffice, so uh, you guys get to see a picture. But what you're seeing here is actually very old, it's about a year old. This was XFS, um, I don't know, I think it was like 4K rights, if I remember right. And rights are in blue, are they in blue? Or they might be red. Well, anyway, one is in red, one is in blue. Um, and what's interesting here is that you can actually see down at the bottom, that's the journal on the disk. And you can see the sequential writes going. So they must be read, I guess, um, to the journal. They're just streaming along. And then on the rest of the disk, you can actually see the different IOs that are happening on the partition that was being used to store the data. You can see there's a lot of scattering, and there's a lot of reads and writes. So there's probably a lot of Ceph, um, in this case, this is really old, but this is, that was probably a lot of like level DB activity or, or other reads that were happening to allow the writes to happen. Maybe even metadata lookups for the directory structure where the objects were stored, inode lookups and other things like that. So SeekWatcher gives you a ton of information. It's really, really useful if you want to diagnose performance problems. Um, so the last thing I'm gonna talk about is Perf. Perf is a profiling tool um, that's distributed as part of the Linux kernel at this point, I think. Um, and it lets you either attach to a currently running process or do a full system profile. Um, if you look here, you can actually see this is some of the output from, I don't know what I was doing. I think I was actually looking at monitors at that point. Um, and in this case, you can see actually that there was a bunch of stuff going on in the Ceph mod. It was using like 87% CPU usage. I think this is when we were doing some debugging on uh, Cuttlefish. Um, the one downside you'll see here is that symbol resolution wasn't working very well. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff here where we're not getting proper symbols. And I think if you have kernel 3.9 or newer, um, they will use libunwind to do that and give you much better symbol resolution. But um, the, the point here is that you get to know a lot of where you're spending your time. Uh, we actually found out on the OSDs for sequential writes that we, our CRC32C uh, algorithm was using a lot of CPU. And that led us to start look at uh, using SSE4 native instructions on Intel CPUs to try to uh, reduce that. So very useful. So OK, where are we going to go from here? Um, certainly. A lot more testing and bug fixing that's constant. Um, erasure coding. Uh, I'm sure Seth or Sage is going to probably talk about this at some point later on, if he hasn't already. Um, but that's really, really interesting. It'll be really interesting to see what kind of performance impact, both good and bad, that potentially could have, because it changes the game in a lot of different ways. Um, cloning uh, from journal writes. So on ButterFS, um, it turns out we may have a way that we could write data into the journal, and then if the journal is on the same, uh, the same file system as the actual data, we might actually be able to just clone the data, meaning that it would still point to the same original um, uh, inodes that w were written to the journal um, without having to do an extra copy. Uh, that would be really, really great. The downside is that Potentially, that means that we're introducing fragmentation into the journal. So it's not totally clear what kind of performance impact that would have, but we think it would probably be better than, than it, it would be doing full, two full data writes. And then our sockets and our DMA uh, for InfiniBand and tiering work. So um, that's it for me.